It's Zhang Hu Hustle. Hello and welcome to another episode of Zhang Hu Hustle. I'm here with my co-host Eric Farmer. And I'm here with my co-host Eli Kurtz. Today we're chatting about Death Duel, a film which was adapted from the same Gulong novel as our previous watch, Swordmaster, which was a recommendation from one of our Patreon patrons, Chromatic Chameleon. So thanks for giving us this double whammy, Chromatic Chameleon. Yeah, I mean, you didn't ask for it, but we're going to give it to you anyway. Uh, (laughs) Just a heads up, everybody. There are some content warnings for this movie. Uh, There's a scene of sort of domestic honor murder. Uh, and there are a couple of scenes of some pretty gruesome, gory surgery. Uh, yeah. So, but it's the it's sort of '70s style. So, but it's still pretty yucky. Yeah, it looks pretty fake, but it also still turned my stomach. So, <laughs> worth letting all <laughs> you folks know about this. <laughs> All right, so before we get into the discussion of the movie, we need to thank our Patreon patrons, because we have a Patreon, don't we? We sure do, at patreon.com slash Hustle. If you want to drop by and see what we're about there, uh, you're welcome to do that. But all of these lovely people already have. That's right. And so, without further ado, Anders Gabrielson, Andreas Tavauer, Andrew Dacey, Brian Kurtz, Chromatic Chameleon, Craig, Dave, David Millions, Derek Smith, Eric Bontz, Fraser Ronald, Gallant Night Games, J. David Chrisman, Jared Rasher, Jason Detman, Jeremy Marr, Jim, John Cole, Kevin Lovecraft, Laura Penrod, Leonard Murphy, Liam Murray, Lowell Francis, Misdirected Mark Productions, PK, Rob Abrazado, Sean Nicholson, and Todd Crapper. Thank you so much for your support. Yeah, thanks so much. Uh, what you do just helps us... Uh put some stuff in the coffers for the upcoming game project that we are actively developing if if slowly uh and uh will really help us get that off the ground when it's finally time to put it in front of people that's right yeah we're still heavy into training right now but the training is uh bearing some fruit and we can't wait to test our skills against the rest of the martial mm-hmm. world yes yeah, so that's right we we we've we've suffered some setbacks but we're just we're just learning A little bit more every day. That's right. Speaking of setbacks and taking on the martial world, this movie is full of both, isn't it? Oh, man. It's kind of what I wanted from Swordmaster, Mm -hmm. but it it's but also not like they're they're the same story, but they're very different. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think you and I sort of had opposite feelings about these films. I thought that Swordmaster was kind of compelling uh, despite some of the flaws that I saw in it. And I think that the balance of flaws and compelling content was just barely reversed for me on this film. Um, but that's something that I want to get to pretty far into the episode. So, yeah, I, I think, I think we are like exactly opposite. I think this is definitely a flawed movie on the other side, but it's kind of more in my style that I prefer. Yeah. And so it really, it landed for me. Plus there's an Easter egg that was like aimed right at me. <laughs> it really was. Yeah. <laughs> I saw it and I was like, no way. Um, <laughs> so you want to share some details about the film? Yeah. So death duels from 1977, the director and writer was Chor Yuan. The cinematography was by Wong Chit. The choreographer is Lin Dian and Yuan Bin. The cast is Derek Yi as Third Master or Hopeless Ah Chi, Ling Yun as Yen Shisan, Candice Yu as Xiao Li, and Cheng Ping as Mu Yung Chu Ti. So these names should sound pretty familiar. They should, and in more ways than one, because if you remember, Derek Yi, who plays the Third Master in this movie, directed Swordmaster, and also mm. Chor Yuan, who directed and wrote this movie also directed The Magic Blade and Sentimental Swordsman, which we've discussed both of on the show. Yeah, great. All great pictures. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So Death Duel's plot is predictably similar to Swordmaster. Yen Shisan is number one in the swordplay world, but the Mu Young clan shows up and says he can't hold that title unless he kills the third master of the Supreme Sword Mansion. Yen Shisan travels to Supreme Sword Mansion only to find the third master is already dead. We cut to the brothel, where useless Achi is already getting acquainted with the family of a sex worker named Xiao Li. Almost immediately, the Mu Young clan shows up, ruins everything, and sets the third master on a path of bloodshed, injury, and revenge. Yeah, but there's some key differences. The third master is the one who gets poisoned. 
uh, and doomed to die in mere days, not Yen Shisan. Uh, there's less focus on Shaoli's family and community and the class dynamics. It's in there a little bit, uh, and in some ways that I found pretty poignant that I think we'll talk about, but it's definitely not the main focus. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's a lot more fights. <laughs> I counted. There's, <laughs> there's at least ten. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Uh, and we're definitely going to talk about those because I think they they definitely communicate a lot. Uh, and the final fight starts off between the third master and Yen Shisan. Then Mu Young Chu Ti interrupts it with the help of her brother, who mastered the martial arts to such a degree that it drove him mad. They fight until the brother turns his back on his sibling and clan and runs away. Third Master and Yen Shisan resume their fight, and it seems Yen Shisan wins. Third Master concedes and walks away. Then Yen Shisan realizes he's been stabbed in the chest. He dies satisfied that he has truly tested his martial skills, and Third Master remains number one in the martial world. So for me, it was really cool to watch this movie and see the ways that the plot elements were all there, but they were definitely remixed. Oh, for sure. Yen Shisan is much more of a peripheral character. Uh, uh-huh. it's that de- their stories are definitely intertwined, uh, but it's not, uh, one of the things in Swordmaster was that Yen Shisan had like the first 20 minutes of the movie, mm-hmm. uh, before we even encountered the third master as Achi. Uh, and this one you get, you get the sort of the opening setup and that takes a couple minutes. Uh, and then you, and then it kind of moves into the third master story mm-hmm. and then they sort of intertwine from there. Yeah, uh, in a way that was a little made a little bit more sense to me. I think probably made a little less sense to you, but I think sort of six of one, half a dozen of the other. Emphasis on third master slash Achi is, I think, kind of diminished in this movie in the sense that the third master very quickly picks up his sword again. Uh, we <laughs> he get, does. yeah, we get like the barest glimpse of him being willing to just take a blow whenever the random dude in the brothel, uh, cuts him on the arms in exchange for letting the sex worker go. Uh, fun mm-hmm. fact too, the guy who does the cutting right there is the same mm-hmm. guy who plays the landlord in Kung Fu Hustle. Oh man. Yeah. Man, our worlds just, just collide. I know cameos all over the place. It's wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> um but yeah so like we see third master sort of re-embrace the sword play world so much faster than we did in sword master and we also mm. i think we get a lot of communication through violence and through fight scenes but i think that we miss out on some helpful exposition that we did get in Swordmaster. So my experience watching Swordmaster first and then watching this movie, I was like, oh, well, at least I know everything that's going on. Mm -hmm. Um, At least I kind of have an idea of all of the nuances in the history here. And I think getting that dual perspective on a novel that neither one of us have have read was actually really helpful. Oh, for sure. And I had a hard time separating out like whether when I watched this movie, is it making more sense because I have seen Swordmaster or is it because the storytelling just makes more sense to me? Um, And Mm -hmm. I don't think I can necessarily separate those two. I don't think that the story was as dramatic as it was in Swordmaster. I think in Swordmaster, there was definitely, they definitely put third master kind of through his paces a little more, especially Mm -hmm. because we, we both just really fell in love with the family Mm -hmm. Uh, and Shaoli. I actually kind of liked the romance between Shaoli and third master in this one a little better. Mm -hmm. Uh, It felt a little more earned, Um, but there were other parts of it that like, I was still heartbroken when when the mom gets killed, and mm-hmm. that's the thing that that causes Third Master to sort of reemerge. Yeah, but uh, it was not nearly as powerful as it was, and also the the stakes were brought down quite a bit. Mm-hmm. Uh, we didn't have this whole other storyline with Mu Young Chuti's servant that was also running this other clan of disaffected people like that that whole storyline doesn't exist Mm -hmm. in this one yeah and i think because the stakes were so much lower throughout this i i think that's where 
I disconnected mm. from the movie a little bit. I thought that the set pieces were mm. gorgeous. I thought that the fight choreography was well done and well filmed. Um, I thought that the like sort of character iconic traits were there, but the stakes felt so much lower because it really felt like it was just, okay, well, let's get to the next fight now. Okay, mm-hmm. well, now we've got this cool fight. Okay, let's get to the next fight now. And the fights told stories, but I think that, like you said, the stakes were a little higher and a little more personal in. Yeah, sort of I, I would agree with that. I think this one pulled off some good twists that I wasn't necessarily oh, expecting. Yeah. Um, and mm-hmm. that, but I do, I think you're right. I think the bulk of this movie is in the fights because they're just, I think they're just so eager mm-hmm. to get third master sort of back into the scene and doing fights that they rush, that they yeah. rush his, his transition from Achi back into being third master again. Uh, and so I think if the movie falls down in any place, mm-hmm. it's probably that, but I feel like the, the sort of parallel storyline, the parallel storyline of Yen Shisan uh, has some kind of fun twists to it in the way that uh, he and Third Master sort of interact towards the like the last third of the movie. Yeah, well, and you know the the whole thing about how Yen Shisan was the mm. boatman eventually, and Yen Shisan is responsible for healing Third Master of his poison before he even realized who it was. I thought that was a cool twist, and I thought that it was a nice contrast from Swordmaster, where they still have that sort of anonymous help that is given to each one of them, but it's it's not really in the context of, oh, you're injured and I can heal you. And I think that is a really cool contrast between the two films. In Swordmaster, Yenshi-san is like, well, I give up the swordplay world, but oh, you know what? I'm going to teach all everything I know to this mm. random stranger, whereas in death duel he's already given up and he's already retreated to this lake where he's just ferrying people across and then he decides oh this guy is injured okay well i'm going to heal this guy uh and especially because twice before we saw people say oh i'll help you and then they poison mm-hmm. him further it was really cool to see his ultimate rival be the one who treated him with respect right and something that i brought up uh that i i sent to you in a message was there's a little like love theme that there's a little sort of light motif in the music that normally plays with Shaoli right. and and Achi when they're having those sort of romantic scenes and like right at the end of the movie when Yenshi San realizes that he's actually lost after he thought he won after he thought he bested third master there's just a little hint of that love theme that plays and then credits yeah, and you know what? That's that's so cool that you noticed that too because I do not whenever I'm watching a movie, the soundtrack is very mm. ambient for me and I'm almost never really aware of it, but that's such a cool little detail, this sort of like almost intimate rivalry that that becomes an expression of love between the two of them. And we see that more explicitly in right. Swordmaster. At the end when their final conversation happens, they really sort of pour out their hearts to each other and talk about how much they respect each other and how swordsmen are supposed to live this way. But keeping that subtle in the form of just a soundtrack motif is so cool. And I me. think we see that Yen Shisan has sort of reached his lowest point by the time that the poisoned and on death door third master, you know, shows up in his boat. Uh, you know, he's scruffy, mm-hmm. he's just a ferryman, and he's almost unrecognizable as the same character. It's that, I think it's sort of like that act of compassion that's unintentional, but it ends up driving them towards the end of the story, and then they both have to work together to defeat Second Master, which is a weird part of the movie, before they can finally have their, <laughs> Way out of before they field. can finally have their, like, intimate fight scene. Yeah, and that's super yeah. cool to me. Um, speaking of sort of, you know, being carried through the movie, I was really aware of how much weight the fights carry throughout this mm-hmm. entire movie. I had mentioned earlier that there were at least 10 fights, uh, and there are 10 fights of consequence in one way or another. So I wanted to go through those with you and sort of talk about, you know, what we learn from each one. Let's do it. Cool. So the very first fight is the first scene in the movie. 
uh, and it's where Yen Shisan has gathered six swordsmen together. Uh, he, he sort of gathered them together and told them, you know, noon on this date at this place, uh, come with your throats bared and your oh, swords such drawn. a good line. I thought that was such a cool... Yeah, it really was. And they're like, okay, well, which one of us fights you first? And he's like, nah, it won't be necessary. I can take all six of you on at the same time, and I'll kill you all within 13 blows. And I was like, <laughs> what? <laughs> Yep, and then he does it <laughs> it's not even a big deal and then he's like hey you two people hiding behind the tree come out here and talk to me and so we find out that the muyang clan has showed up and they've sort of used this opportunity to approach a master swordsman and muyang chu ti says hey you know like clearly you're skilled but uh you know about the Supreme Sword Mansion, and you know about this guy named the Third Master at the Supreme Sword Mansion? Well, he's the best person in the swordplay world. He's killed 46 of our clansmen, and, uh, well, if you won't consent to fight him, then you can't hold on to the title of number one. And I was like, wow, what a what a power move. <laughs> yeah, it's... So, uh, Chu T in this movie is much more just purely ambitious in this movie uh she's she's her yeah. there's no th- yeah there's no romance in this movie in 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 between yeah. chuti and third master it's purely a power play mm-hmm. uh and i love later when when you find out that the reason that third master has killed 46 of her clansmen it's because she's tried to assassinate him 46 times <laughs> yeah <laughs> Wow. Give up. Give up, gal. He's just not that into you. Yeah. Find another man. No kidding. Ugh. So, like, that was really cool establishing oh, stakes yeah. for me. You know, like, we see the scale of Yen Shisan. We see that there are other powerful forces in the world. We see that there, the, the swordplay world is huge. And we also see that Yen Shisan is proud enough that he can be threatened just by calling his mastery mm, into question mm-hmm. right because she's like she's like well how can you beat him if his sword is divine and and all of this stuff and just right. really needles him yeah mm-hmm. yeah and so yen shisan is like okay well i'll go find him so he goes to the supreme sword mansion finds out he's dead and then pretty much immediately we cut to the brothel and we very quickly are introduced to the sex worker and her family and we see that uh, third master is already kind of plugged in with them and then the brothel people show up because uh Shaoli has decided that she's not going to work for them anymore and they're like no you have to come back and this is like the first opportunity for us to see third master's skills and they're so potent that not only does he take on all of these swordsmen while he's unarmed, but he also like knocks them through doors at the very end. He knocks them through a brick wall. He knocks two of them through at the same time. And that was such a cool shot for me too, because it was fixed camera and we see these people fly through the the brick wall and collapse on the, the grass outside and framed perfectly in the, brick hole in the wall we see perfectly framed just third master right there with a little bit of lighting to make him look like a total (laughs) boss yeah so we get we get our two so our first two fight scenes right our sort of scale establishing fight scenes right we see Mm -hmm. yen shisan demonstrating his 13 blows and then when we see what third master can do without a weapon and we're like okay all right well this this is ramping up to be like, this is the big confrontation that we're going to see at the end, right? We've set up these two characters, yeah. and we know, we know we want to see them fight. Yeah, if we've got our subtext scanners turned on, we can definitely tell that, like, these are the two figures, and they both interact with the world in different ways, and they both have relationships to the swordplay world in different ways. But they're both definitely skilled. So the third fight happens very quickly afterward uh the brothel gang goes back to the brothel and they're like whoa this dude's super powerful we don't know what's going on so the brothel owner sends some more people to go get him and third master makes quick work of these people but as a result one of the mu young clan's goons watches this and identifies the third master and is like hey you've got to come with me if you want to know who i am and if you want to know who you are of course he takes the third master to Mu Young Chu Ti. She propositions him yet again. 
he's not into it and uh he he goes away and that like basically all we see there is that that's the chance for mu young chu t to give him the offer that she's given him so many times before right but we get to we get to see it on screen and we don't know whether or not it's been in person before and so she's able to sort of give him the full court press right she she mm-hmm. takes him she's in the courtyard so he sees all of her wealth and then she shows him her body and then we get to see that even in the state that he's in he is always prepared for treachery when she tries to, when she tries to kill mm-hmm. him and he just effortlessly escapes yeah it's not even a problem and very soon afterward we get the fourth fight where he is back with uh Shaoli's family and there are these two chestnut vendors who are wandering by. And this was one of those really cool moments where you notice the sort of class dynamics at play. Yeah, I really liked this one. So he sees these two chestnut vendors and he starts asking them like, Hey, how much are your chestnuts? And that sort of thing. And it's kind of a weird, it's kind of a weird little scene. And then he, he says, fine, I'll take a (laughs) hundred. And they're like, uh, Mm -hmm. no, we don't have a (laughs) hundred. And he's like, great, well, then I'll just take what you've got plus you because you're clearly not what you say you are. And he he reveals their disguise. And the reason he's able to reveal their disguise is I think it's showing that he's lived with this sort of lower class family. And he's like, nobody here can afford roasted chestnuts. Your disguise is bad for for mm-hmm. this. It is out of place in this particular sort of social station that we're in. Uh, and that was the main thing that I really, I sort of liked about it, but it also is where he learns that Mu Yung Chu Ti has sent, sent even more assassins after him. And, and he makes really quick work of the assassins, but it's also, yeah, like you said, where we learn that, oh, Chu Ti wants mm-hmm. him dead again. Uh, and, and so even though he tried to get away and even though he tried to live an innocuous life at the lower end of the class spectrum, we still see that he can't get out and there are still people who are going to be coming for him no matter what. And the next few fights that we see are actually solid examples of that. Um, so the Yu Mien brothers are accomplices of the Mu Young clan and they are sort of on their own little tear through the martial world, going to restaurants and fighting people, going to, like, you know, headquarters of different clans and fighting people. And they go to the Black Sock clan and destroy it. Uh, the third master shows up and they threaten him. And they say, of these two sides, us two versus you, only one of us will be able to remain anonymous to the swordplay world. And that's whoever wins mm-hmm. this fight. And I didn't get the impression that the Yumian brothers were anonymous, but regardless, I think the threat was conveyed that they will reveal who the third master is if they win this fight and kill him. Well, I think it's either it's either you die to us or your identity is revealed. Those are the sta- uh, those are the stakes yeah, yeah. of the fight. Okay, yeah, yeah, that might have uh, it might have just been a problem of like the <laughs> they, subtitles they or something. Great. It was kind of yeah. garbled for me. They were not, no. I mean, uh, we watched this on YouTube, and, uh, well, you you get what you get. (laughs) It's available for rent, by the way, for like a dollar or two. It's very reasonable. Anyway, so the third master beats them, and they say that, of course, you're the third master because the only people in the entire swordplay world who are equal to our skill are the third master. Right, so we see this, this ranking of the martial world again, right? We see that... The first two spots are in contention, Mm -hmm. but in spot sort of tied for spot three are the Yumian brothers. So and and that's an interesting way of like we can use this information to our advantage, which is kind of an interesting thing that you could you could see being brought into a game. Absolutely, yeah. One of the one of the more gameable things that we see Mm -hmm. in this movie. So the sixth fight is not super major. We are attacked at a house uh, by this guy whose name is Brother Mute. Um, He he doesn't speak. He just kind of, you know, vocalizes and third master fights the people off, but then he doesn't feel well afterward. And so they go to this healer and the healer is like, oh yeah, I'll give you this special medicine, cuts his arm open, says, oh yeah, you're poisoned, gives him this special medicine. And then the healer's like, oh, psych, I actually poisoned you <laughs> even more. That's too bad. You've only got three days to live. 
Right. <laughs> and this is the moment when we get that content warning for domestic murder. This is where Brother Mute kills his wife because his wife took a bribe to sell out the third master. Right. She drugged him with the tea that he drank, which is why. Yeah. And so he thought he was really poisoned. And she did it from she did it for money and to sort of like keep her lifestyle safe. And so brother. Yeah. So brother mute is, ends up killing his wife. Yeah. And then he dies soon afterward. Um, but there's this kind of moment that for me doesn't read well, where third master is like, oh, I, I still see that you have an honorable heart or whatever. And I'm like, yeah, but he also killed his wife really <laughs> fast. Um, I think that's kind of just the way wuxia culture works it's like it's a very vengeance based yeah. culture as we've seen throughout a lot of films but it still made me you know personally uncomfortable here in 2019 it was one of my least favorite parts that was different from the other movies but it it, it was what it was but anyway in the terms of in terms of this fight, we see that uh, Third Master is not above being deceived and being weakened by being poisoned. But we also see that even after he's been poisoned, he's still really deadly. He kills the healer and all of the healer's goons. Uh, makes pretty quick work of them, in fact. So in the, the eighth fight, so we're, we're really like winding towards the end of the movie here. But Third Master is poisoned. Uh, he's had a heart to heart with Shao Li. He doesn't expect to return, but he sort of knows of a person that can potentially heal him. But on the way, he tries to stop a gang from assaulting a woman, but he's so weakened by the poison that we learn that he can be injured to the point of defeat. But then a veteran Shaw with a very sharp hat shows up to do what third master couldn't. Then he tells third master he'll fight him next year. If third master survives that long. So maybe you know, part two. But then mm -hmm. Fu Hung Se shows up. He makes a cameo. Fu Hung Se, the hero of the magic blade, shows up in the movie as the same mm -hmm. character. Yeah, I saw that homage poncho from uh, yeah, for sure movie, and I was like, no <laughs> way. I got to text Eric <laughs> right away. <laughs> oh, I was so excited. It felt, it felt like a love letter right to me because I love the magic blade so much. Mm -hmm. And uh, he doesn't play like a huge role. He basically just tells him he tells him where the the boatman is, right? Uh, yeah, I think so. And he also tells him he he gives him advice that basically amounts to like, hey, you know, you're living pretty mm -hmm. fast. Uh, I, I got out of this life, and and I know you want to, but you're gonna have to live differently than this if you actually want to get out of it. I I gotta say a couple things about this scene too. So before the fight starts, oh, such a good scene. It's maybe my favorite moment in the whole movie. He's in the tavern, and he's facing you know his death and he's getting really existential and he there's like a confucian scholar in there and there's the the tavern owner and his daughter and he asked the confucian scholar he's like hey you know if you found out you only had today to live what would you do and the confucian scholar is like oh well i'd, I'd arrange my funeral and i'd say goodbye to my loved ones of course and then uh third master is like no but what would you really do and like like night and day the confucian scholars like i'd gamble all my money away and i'd go to the brothel and i'd sleep with all the women and that's what i've always wanted to do oh no and then he like picks up his books and jumps over the table and <laughs> runs out of the tavern <laughs> and then and then the third master is talking to the dad and the daughter the owner of the of the tavern and his daughter and he's like yeah what would you do and the and the dad's like oh well you know she she was married, but or she was going to be married, but her fiance ran out on her, and of course she's remained pure these past ten years. It's been hard, but man, how how admirable, you know. And he's like, okay, well, what would you do, daughter, uh, if you only had a day to live? And she's like, I'd find the first man I saw and I'd sleep with him right away because I want it so bad. And then she like runs out while the dad's chasing her out, and this radical truth telling that third master inspires is just hilarious to me it's so funny and it's 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 like earthy and like it kind of breaks up the tone of the movie a little bit in a really nice way it really does but it's also like one more thing that's just way out of left field in this movie too i just i couldn't help but mention it i wouldn't have been able to sleep yeah, if i fair, hadn't fair enough, in the episode fair enough um yeah but still, like, we learn some things in this fight. You know, we learn that Third Master certainly mm -hmm. has limits. If he's too poisoned, he cannot defeat a gang of people. Uh, we also know that there are people in the swordplay world who aren't all that interested in killing him, at least not right now. 
And we learn that there are people who have gotten out of the swordplay world and have been able to stay out of it except for when they want to come back into it. Uh, and all of those things, I think, are really relevant to Third Master's situation. So the the Shaw with the, the circular saw in his hat, I'm assuming the context that I got from it was that he mm-hmm. wasn't interested in fighting Third Master sort of at his lowest. I think a year. I think he's sort of like, well, if you live through this, yeah, you know, I'll find you in a year and then and then it'll be a fair fight. And he doesn't even tell uh, Third mm-hmm. Master his name. Third Master asks, and he's like, yeah, uh, I have lasted in this world as long as I have because I'm not as free with my right. name as you are with yours. <laughs> Shuts him yeah, down it's totally. Yeah, it's pretty good. He, he's a weird character, but I liked it. I also liked the, he's like, hey, that guy bought me a drink, so I'm obligated to protect him now. And like... Yeah, it's a nice little courteous thing, right? Yeah, it was a really like nice courte he might have had other motivations, but I feel like bit of courtesy was the thing that you needed to like flip that character onto your side sort of temporarily. And it was it was a nice little touch. Mm-hmm. Uh it reminded me of the beginning of Yeah, that's an interesting It reminded idea. me of uh the two characters in Sentimental Swordsman when uh they he's mm-hmm. like, I'm gonna I'm gonna buy you a drink and he's like He's like, you don't have to buy me anything. And it's like, I just want to have a drink with you. But they end up becoming friends over that exchange. Um, and it, it sort of yeah. it sort of reminded me of that. So uh, it's a nice is a nice bit. There's actually quite a bit sort of packed into that scene, even if it feels a little random. Yeah, well, and it's kind of third master right. at his lowest. So it makes sense that we would learn some important things in that fight. But there's like weird world building that like just doesn't come up. It's true. Yeah. And it's very like, you know, it's in the final quarter Mm. of the movie, too. So it's kind of a strange place to continue building out the world. But um, regardless, we move on from that fight and Third Master gets healed by uh, Yen Shisan. And then uh, Yen Shisan goes to the Mu Young clan, kind of is forced to show up there. And Chu Ti reveals that Third Master is not actually dead. And reveals, in fact, that it's the guy that Yen Shisan helped to heal. And Yen Shisan is like, oh, well, no, this won't do. <laughs> <laughs> and then Chu Ti duels with Yen Shisan a little bit and shows Yen Shisan all of the moves that Third Master uses that are really advanced. And Chu Ti is like, well, now that I've shown you these things, hopefully you'll be able to kill him and end and my suffering in this regard um and so yen shisan seeks out third master third master at this point has lost shao li and so he puts on his armor and he gets all of his like 20 swords that he keeps rolled up in a bag and they show down in this another gorgeous set piece uh they have a lot of sword fights where like their swords break and stuff um and then they're interrupted by the mu young clan and we have that moment with the second master who fights for like two seconds and then runs away in a rampage and then yen shisan right he kills he kills chu t and then because she's kept him imprisoned all of these years and it's very weird i feel like there's probably some sort of deeper plot line there in the book that we just miss out on oh for sure but it, it seemed really abrupt to me in the context of the movie, especially because it had nothing at all to do with sword right. master. Yeah. But anyway, so Yen Shisan and third master finished their duel and, and we already described that. So the finale is the moment where all the cards are on the table and where we finally figure out which one of them is going to be the better swordsman, third master or Yen Shisan. But otherwise, like it's the end of the movie. We don't get a whole lot of, you know, revelation out of this thing. It doesn't, it doesn't advance the plot so much as it ends the plot. Right. This is, this is the culmination of, we saw the two sort of setup scenes at the beginning establishing scale. And then this is Mm -hmm. the end where we, we see these characters who've both kind of hit their lowest achieve their sort of, uh, character goals, right? Yen Shisan gets to fight the third master and, have his skills proven even if he still loses and Mm -hmm. the third master does sort of walk off into the distance uh, presumably to abandon the swordplay world again but who can say Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. Uh, it, we we really don't know. And I, I feel like he's still wearing his armor. He doesn't have his swords anymore. He kind of drops them on the ground. So it really is ambiguous. Mm-hmm. could go anyway. Uh, I feel like, we, you know, we talked about how he sort of jumped back into being third master again. I feel like what the movie was trying mm-hmm. to say is when he gets his armor, he gets his swords, and he gets all of his dudes back. He he mm-hmm. he's, he takes control over Supreme Sword Bench and again that that's when he is taking on the role of the third master again Mm -hmm. um but i don't know that like doing it in an intermediate way is necessarily like super effective for storytelling i agree yeah um but you know that's just one of the several examples of kind of a little too subtextual revelation Mm -hmm. for me in this movie we have mentioned, though, throughout all this discussion that the sets were amazing. Oh and I want to talk about that some more. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, let's let's move on to our, our gameable ideas, because that's top of the list. I I uh-huh. loved the opening sets. I actually loved most of the sets in this movie, but they're definitely sets, right? Yeah. The, the artifice is front and center. You can tell that this is a film studio. You can tell that the trees are not real. The grass is just like very thin turf, mm. um, but still, it's so well crafted and so stylized that I just couldn't look away the whole time. And it it makes sense that this is directed by the same person that directed the Magic Blade, because the Magic Blade mm-hmm. also has that sense of almost being a play. It has that mm-hmm. artifice that you buy into, even though you know, even though you look at it and go, "Well, this is all obviously fake." Right. But it doesn't yeah. it doesn't detract from the story. And in fact, in a lot of ways, I find that it adds to the story of layering on this mm-hmm. this artificial ness. It kind of is similar to more modern movies that are super CGI heavy, mm-hmm. but that CGI helps you to realize the heightened reality of the situation, or it helps you to realize the larger than life qualities of the story. Uh, And I think that these sets do a very similar sort of thing. I'm curious though, how do you think that could be gamified? So I think that there are a, there are some ways to do it. I think if sets are like specific in the way that they are in this movie, that they are specific for a reason. Right. And so I think Mm -hmm. setting up a scene where you think very intentionally about the space that it's set in and what that space means. And even taking a second to sort of like at the beginning of the movie, there's all of these people waiting for Yen Shisan to show up. And it's sort of, you know, mm-hmm. sort of move, the camera moves around and it looks at them and you have this sort of sense of expectation and you get a sense of the space. Uh, and then when Yen Shisan sort of enters stage left, Right, and it sort of comes up over the over the hill, uh, and then down and down onto the 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 main stage area. That you know that like the play has started. Um, yeah, yeah, and you know what? This is reminding me of Hero, mm-hmm. and how Hero uses different color palettes to tell stories from different perspectives, and that is clearly artifice, but it helps our understanding of the story. Mm-hmm. And I think the. Th- the thing about artifice is that when you say, like when we talk, when we were talking about the magic blade, we said, well, this is very sort of dreamlike. Any, a lot of different things could happen because of the artificiality of this one. And this one's sort of less dreamlike, but it's very, um, there's a lot of sort of like nobility and beauty in the, the set design and the costume design. And, it helps tell you what kind of story you're telling and it constrains you a little bit. And if you want to mm-hmm. move it, I think it keeps you from wandering like outside of the scope of the story. If you say like, here's our mm-hmm. set that we're going to, we're going to do. And if we choose to move, that's okay. But this scene has to be over, right? Like this scene, this yeah. scene's done. That's interesting. Yeah. Um, there's plenty that you can play around with on this set, but it's overall a fairly small area mm-hmm. in terms of square footage. And we are constrained here. This is a pressure cooker for us right now. Right. And then when we move to another set, it has another meaning. 
and that scene mm-hmm. will have that meaning that we're ascribing to it. Like the, uh, the boat scene is, is, you know, it's moonlit and lonely and it's dark and, you know, all of these things. And, and the space is because you've got the water there again, it's constrained. Um, and the little hut that the boatman lives in, who it turns out to be in Shisan, um, is not even like really like a physical space that you can go into, which is sort of like up there in a way that it would be mm-hmm. uh, on a stage, you know, just sort of like mm-hmm. upstairs lights. And you're like, we know that there is an upstairs there yeah. that we can imagine, but that is not where the scene is. The scene is here. You know, so I'm thinking about how to uh, incorporate this into a game. And I think, you know, like talking about the constraint of things is useful. And I think that sort of providing a, an agenda or principle for people to paint the scenery with a vibrant brush mm-hmm. is helpful too. But I'm also thinking about in terms of the production of a game book, mm-hmm. uh, it would be interesting to give the art direction that we want the backgrounds to be artificial. Mm-hmm. We want them to look like a stage set. We want them to look like something that you would see in a, in a theater. Mm-hmm. And I think, you know, that makes me think about, um, feng shui or something where they have a very explicit treatment of camera shots and things oh, like sure. that. And the artifice is part of the game's mechanics. And I don't know that that's like, I had never really considered until now that that might be something that we would pursue in our own game, but it's certainly worth percolating for a little while. So I know we're not in the stealing his art section, but I want to bring up the daughters of Verona, uh, which is a game we talked about back in our comedy episode. Which is so, um, I think uh-huh. when we talked about Kung Fu Hustle and uh-huh. it, that I brought that one up, I think based because of priming, but it's, it's, it's a improvise your own Shakespeare romance comedy. Yeah, I remember you talking about and this. And it has these cards that have like essentially like sets on them. Uh, and you, depending on how they come up, you can always revisit one that's like still visible, but the, there's a way that you play them so that you end up covering some of them up and they have little like inspirational things on them. And it gives it this like constraint, but also um, you can always like return to a previous set that you've built essentially in the narrative. Mm. And, you know, you can have a new scene there that's a game that like is explicitly theatrical, you know, where like feng shui is like explicitly cinematic. Uh Uh, It's the only game that I've seen that's explicitly theatrical. I like that. And I like the idea of not only making the sets a little constrained, but also making the idea of having a limited number of sets that you can draw from Mm -hmm. creating some constraint as well. If the sets are going to be, as important as characters, if they are going to have that kind of tonal effect on a story, then sometimes it's important to revisit them in the way that you would revisit a character that's important. Uh, I don't think we saw that that much yeah. in this movie, but like I think we were both struck by the the artifice and the theatricality of this this movie and how it feels totally. really comfortable to you and I in terms of like a storytelling device. On another note, you had made an interesting point about how looking at this story through the lens of two different movies is similar to running the same story in two different systems. Right. So I, when I wa- I watched this one first after I got done watching death duel to see if it was a movie that I thought that you and I should even do. Wow, Swordmaster feels like Hearts of Wu Lin, and this movie feels like this game that we are making. And yeah, and so it reminded me of taking like an adventure or a pre written story and running them in two different systems and sort of seeing what happens. Because mm-hmm. uh, sometimes that's really yeah. that's really interesting, and and you get weird results. Mm-hmm. And interesting results. And it'll also tell you like what parts of your story, your system rewards and emphasizes and which parts it sort of like puts to the wayside, right? Like so Sword Swordmaster was this very like melodramatic, we had these big relationships, 
uh, we had these really big characters and they were all, you know, it was all very messy and entangled and romance and all of that sort of thing. And I, that felt very much like, like hearts of like a hearts of Ulin game. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And we even sort of talked about like entanglements between the characters in that movie. Well, we didn't really, when we were talking about this movie, uh, I think they were there. And I think that like in a game that you and I would make, I think we definitely would have, we would sort of bulk up that part of the story. Mm -hmm. But this one is very much like action forward mm -hmm. to drive the story forward and to like demonstrate what's going on and to put the beats in. And like that felt like something that you and I would do. I feel like what I'm about to say is wrong even before I say it. But All right. it's it seemed like, yeah, right. Uh, with Swordmaster, I got the impression that these relationships were built up in advance and they exist and they are fraught and they're sort of the driving force of the movie. Whereas in death duel, I kind of got the sense that these relationships existed before the movie, but it seemed way more like we were seeing relationship revelations in the course of the movie and mm -hmm. the relationships not just changed throughout the movie, but in a lot of ways they were established throughout the movie. And I guess what I'm saying is that Swordmaster, it seemed like there was more history. And Death Duel, it seemed like there was more in-the-moment revelation. Does that track with you? I think it does. I I feel like the characters in Swordmaster sort of like hit the ground running in that way. And that's mainly what propelled the story forward. Whereas mm. in Death Duel, they have similar motivations, but we had to bring them together in conflict a lot to like sharpen those up and yeah. to, and then to reveal some of like the, the motivations of like uh 2T and Yenshi San and all, all of that kind of thing. So it's a, it's an interesting thing to think about running sort of, I, it, you know, it's, it's like what I've talked about in previous episodes, like when we talk about who are the main characters and then to go, okay, well, if these are our characters, what game are we playing? And mm -hmm. sometimes you watch a movie and you're like, oh, like when we watched the heroic trio. Yeah. And you're like, oh, this is a feng shui game. This is just, that's, yeah. that's, that's what this is. This is a feng shui game. Yeah. 100%. And, uh, and you're like, okay. So, but it's kind of fun to go, okay, well, what if this is our kind of story? What does that tell us about our kind of game? Yeah, absolutely. Well, and to sort of yeah. support your idea, immediately after watching this movie, I drafted a thousand words about how to describe a fight scene. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and then and then I like thought about it for a few more days and I ended up drafting some ideas about character sheets and stuff too. You know, I was like, okay, yeah, mm. this is definitely getting the gears turning. So I think you're right that it's hitting pretty close to our home in some cool ways. I want to also make a quick note. We kind of mentioned it earlier in discussion, but we talked about the explicit mention of ranking in the swordplay world here. And I want to tie that into some ideas that we've had about scale and especially some ideas that Hearts of Wulin has about scale. In Hearts of Wulin, it's very simple. You are either the same scale as your opponent or you're lower or you're higher. And the consequences or the nature of a conflict between you is different depending on that scale relationship. Uh, in this movie, I feel like a lot of the time we saw people who were definitely a lower scale than our protagonist, or they were the same scale in the case of like the Yumian brothers and uh, Yenshi San. Mm -hmm. And we see how easy it is for a higher scale character to tear through lower scale characters. But what was fascinating to me is that I think the Yumian brothers fight is the clearest example of this. They said our only equals are Yen Shisan and the third master. And that means, in my opinion, that when they fought, that was a determination to find out who was going to occupy that position of scale. I, I agree. I think that's explicitly what it was. And I think the consequence, like if, if that fight had gone differently, uh, then the Yumian brothers would, would be like that, 
one step closer to the top, right? And it's mm-hmm. interesting that they can sort of share a spot as well, which is kind of a fun detail. Like yeah. we sort of take them take them as a unit. Yeah. Well, I would imagine that if they were played in a role playing game, it'd be played by one player. Mm-hmm. I mean, it would be kind of fun to have these two that were together, and then the dramatic conflict would be what happens when we reach number one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then the Yumian brothers would have to fight. Yeah, that's compelling for sure. So I guess, yeah, you could approach it several ways. Um, Yeah, yeah. But depending on what your aim, what depending on what your aim of the story is. Yeah. So like the aim that we're shooting for is going to affect how we're going to structure these characters. But something that you had said just a little earlier was interesting to me, too. It made me think that scale in wuxia is similar to but definitely different from the game in highlander uh the sort Mm, of like mm. there can be only one mentality right and obviously there's Mm. no quickening when you defeat a bad guy or a rival in wuxia but all the same there is this notion that oh we are equals well equals cannot exist we have to fight each other and one of us has to be better than the other and that moment determines your scale. And so thinking about Highlander might be an interesting way to think about advancement in our game. You know, if you want to rise Mm. in scale, you have to find somebody who's an equal scale with you, and then you have to defeat them. Right. So you have to advance up the ranking. Right. And you can leave, like, sort of hidden gaps between people so that, like, new people can show up. Mm -hmm. And they can slot in you know, above or below either the, the characters and, and sort of create opposition that way. Yeah. But, but it is kind of fun to think about like them, you literally advancing, you saying that like, I am literally the third most powerful character like in this space. Yeah. And speaking of being the third most powerful, we have talked before, or at least I've mentioned before that it'd be fun to have, you know, 36 scale ranks to go along mm-hmm. with 36th chamber and mm-hmm. we could do that, but I've also talked about having different tiers within there. And and so that way mm-hmm. you can have more isolated or contained stories in terms of scale differences. And I like the idea that when you play a game here, you sit down and you decide, okay, we are X number of characters and we are tightly grouped in terms of scale or we're really spread out in terms of scale, but we are the characters and we are on a collision course with each other. Um, we've kind of flirted with this idea that our game will have PvP elements. Mm. And I'm beginning to think that maybe that's kind of the default for our game. I think it might have to be. Uh, and I th- we, are, we are definitely going to have, we talked about having non-player characters that can be picked up and played by multiple people. And so they can be antagonists or friends and that sort of thing. So it doesn't always have to be like my character versus your character. Mm-hmm. But I think one of the things that's going to drive the story forward is that as these characters rise in scale, they they sort of approach the tip of the pyramid. Yeah. And there's right? less, and, there's and less there can, room And there for, can be only one. Yeah. There's less room for each of them to exist. Yeah, exactly. That's cool. Uh, and they become they become a, 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 a bigger threat to each other as well as, oh, well, there's three masters in this area. Well, that's when a bunch of people start showing up and causing trouble for the, the, the characters because all of a sudden there's a high concentration of masters mm-hmm. to, to deal with. So there's a lot of, I think there's a lot of different ways that you can go with it. They don't necessarily all have to be on a collision course, uh, but I think it is certainly one like really interesting direction to go in. Absolutely, yeah. The last thing I want to talk about here in Gameable Ideas is the notion that every character gets an opening scene, and that opening scene is a demonstration of not only their scale, but also their personality. In this movie and in Swordmaster, those opening scenes were super important sort of character moments for Yen Shisan. Mm-hmm. Uh, we talked about in Swordmaster how he's using his scabbard as kind of a walking stick and it smashes the pavement stones. Uh, and in this one, we have this really tense 
setup scene and instead of just fighting one dude on a bridge she's fighting six dudes Mm -hmm. and he's only going to use 13 strokes to defeat all six guys and you know we also talked about third masters sort of demonstration of of scale and like that's his opening that's really his opening scene as a martial character Mm -hmm. uh and it's kind of fun to have a place where you can cut loose and they are they are really just color scenes like there's there's no story where yen shisan rolls in and says i'm gonna kill all six of you in 13 strokes and then he dies (laughs) and then fails to do so yeah (laughs) (laughs) yeah it's it's like an open display of your power and your character Mm. and your circumstances and those first scenes are just covered in plot armor because they are demonstrating things about your character that will be challenged, but not yet. Mm-hmm. And so they are sort of inviolable in this scene, but we need to see them on screen so that we know that they're going to get challenged. Yeah. So I think a lot of that is stuff that we've kind of gone over before especially the idea of ranking um the opening scenes though i think could bear some serious fruit for us the more we think about that it kind of reminds me of swords without master or something uh the, mm-hmm. the rogues the rogues phase you know it also sort of feeds back into our theatrical nature right like let's let's discover what's in this set mm-hmm. and like what what's our space that we're operating in and then where do our characters fit within that set and then yeah. we'll, then we can st- then the scene starts. Yeah, I really like that. I mean that that scratches my collaborative world building back mm. really well. And you and I both have like theater backgrounds, mm-hmm. so like I feel like that really hits home for both of us. Yeah. So let's do something along those lines then. Nah, let's scrap it. Oh yeah, you're right. Forget it. All right. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so you've got a few things here for stealing his art that I'm curious to I do, I do. So I we were talking in a side hustle that I hadn't seen a face mechanic in any game. Uh and then was immediately proven wrong. <laughs> <laughs> it always happens. Which is fantastic. That way. It yeah. happens. I, I got my hardcover of Stars for That Number, which is a, kind of an OSR style science fiction game, and I flipped to the section on transhuman communities and there was a whole section on face not transhuman um yeah it was transhuman because they it's basically things that like it was like there's no need for physical goods aren't are meaningless now we can generate whatever we need and so only social capital mattered Mm -hmm. Uh, i didn't think that within that book that it was necessarily like super fleshed out um, it was basically just another form of currency. Um, but it was an interesting one because you couldn't take it someplace else and spend it. You couldn't take it to another community and spend it there. And in fact, carrying that with you might actually be dangerous uh, if they opposed the community that you built up a bunch of reputation with. Yeah. Uh, so I thought that was interesting. It gave me some things to think about in terms of different realms within the communities that we've talked about, like the, the noble court and the townsfolk and the Wu Lin and the Zhang Hu in general, and like what kind of effect that has on your ability to engage the your like the face mm-hmm. mechanic of our game. Yeah, that's cool. I like. I haven't idea come of... to any conclusions yet, but but it, it it was a nice little kick in the pants about that. Plus. Plus, this movie didn't so explicitly deal with class like Swordmaster did, Mm -hmm. Um, but it did deal with it. It still dealt with it, right? And it still dealt with the 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 consequences. Yeah, well, and there were different sections of the world that were explored in this movie too. But I think tying it a little more closely to the concept of face, it was certainly the case that you know if you make a threat toward a Shah, they are mm. going to respond to that one way or another. Yen Shisan at the beginning was like, oh, I can't be number one in the swordplay world unless I kill third master. Well, guess what I'm going to go do then? Right. Um, there are a lot of ways that challenging face motivated action in this movie. Mm-hmm. 
Um, so it was kind of fun to be proven wrong. And it's something that in Stars Without Number, it's not a huge thing. It's a couple pages towards the end of the book. No big deal. In our game, I think it's going to have a much more sort of central role. Uh, yeah. So it will be it will be much larger. Um, but it was it was like it was fun to be proven wrong in that way. Um, but moving on, one thing that sort of twigged in my brain when we were talking about rankings and we have brought up uh, Amber Diceless before, but it has a really interesting way of creating your stats at the beginning of the game. I think it's ultimately flawed, but it has an auction for the four stats. Mm. And it makes you bid against your other players. So first of all, it creates instant antagonism before you even have characters. But the other thing that it does is that it means that there aren't really any ties. Mm -hmm. And so even if you, so if you, if you bid 40 and I bid 30, uh, we can, we can, I can, I could say, nope, I'll let, I'll let you have the high warfare stat uh, for, for 40. Uh, but I've still spent 35. Ah. And I could later go to the Game Master and say, Game Master, I want to spend five more of my character points to bump it up to a 40. And he goes, okay, you're still second. <laughs> you, you, you and, you know, like, I, I have 40 and you have 40, but you won it in the auction. So your 40 is higher than my 40. Yeah, okay. And that yeah, is so, interesting because then even when you're quote equals, one mm-hmm. of you is still the one with the chip on his shoulder. Correct. Yes. And you you still have to go after the other person if you ever want to break that ceiling. Yeah, that's very cool. That's very cool. Yeah. Yeah, it's fun. It's not particularly like useful or germane necessarily, mm-hmm. but it was kind of a fun thing to think about. Um, and then, uh, you have, uh, you have a little thingy here kind of talking about our, our circular saw blade hat, man. Yeah. So I was thinking about the nature of compels in the fate system. Mm -hmm. And if we were to look at that fight scene or that entire scene through the lens of fate, it could be that the third master saw there was trouble. Uh, maybe one of his aspects was invoked. He, he stands up for women who are in danger uh, and then he tries to fight but it doesn't go his way and he's defeated and he's in danger of being hurt or killed as a result of it Um, I think we could look at that in such a way that it's like okay well you rolled poorly a complication there is that you're going to get beaten up Uh, this is the compel you can either get beaten up or you can spend a fate point and help will arrive uh, just in the nick of time. And in this case, I think it would be a little bit anachronistic or a little bit out of order in fate. It would be like, okay, well, you know, I was at this tavern and then this woman shows up and she's in trouble. So I try to help her complication. Oh no, I wasn't able to help her. I'm going to spend a fate point to get some help. And we're going to flash back to when I arrived at the tavern and I ordered everybody a round of drinks and now that's the source of my temporary ally. Uh, that mm-hmm. could be one way that you describe the events of that scene. Right. It could be um, instead of a compel, fate also has concessions. So if you mm-hmm. concede a conflict, uh, mm. you get to you get to sort of like ask for things, and you could say, "Okay, well, I lose. I I I'm electing to lose the conflict with these thugs, right? But." Maybe someone else steps in and now I have a new rival. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah. So multiple ways you could handle that scene. Mm-hmm. But regardless, that's certainly something that could be gamified by existing rules. I want to move on to the comments section, which is resurrected after some time spent in seclusion on a mountaintop somewhere. Um, we haven't really received some comments in a little while. And if any of you ever have questions or anything, you're welcome to send them in. We'd love to discuss them on the show and, and, you know, give you our take on things. Um, But one of the things that I experienced with this movie, it it triggered a a memory in me where I seem to remember at some point in time hearing that Wuxia films were often cut down and heavily edited for a Western audience's uh, consumption. And I don't think that's necessary but that's what happened in history 
And so I wondered, because so much is just sort of assumed in this movie and in a lot of movies from the 70s and 80s, that I wondered how much of this movie was cut down. I couldn't find any information mm. on this movie in particular, but I uh, sent a message to friend of the show, Brendan Davis, who also has a podcast called The Bedrock Podcast, where they do some wuxia reviews. Uh, and I asked if he was familiar with that phenomenon, if there was maybe like a term that could be attached to it or whatever. And he gave us a long response. I'm going to kind of read an edited down version of that. But um he starts off, I'm not 100% certain what you're referring to. Do you mean how they condense film running times from like two hours to 90 minutes? If so, that's something I'm pretty unclear on. I think Hong Kong movies are made with international distribution in mind, so everything from the runtime to the dubs and subs are all planned out like that in advance. In other words, they record all the different language dubs at once. Uh, he goes on to say, I know with Death Duel, it has the typical Chor Yuen thing where it's loaded with characters crammed into a fairly short runtime. How much of that is due to editing down for Western release? I'm not sure. He says, I have the Blu-ray and the older DVD and both have the same runtime. Usually, if you're hell-bent on getting to the bottom of that, there, if there is a longer runtime version of a movie, uh, you often have to get it from sharing groups on Facebook or bootleg stores or, or what have you. Uh, and then he says, but the other part of the equation, as I understand it, is that a lot of these movies being based on known wuxia works expected audiences to understand the plot beats anyway. So they also could skip around a bit. He says, I think Brave Archer has a lot of that. With Chor Yuen, it always feels to me like there is a bit of expecting the audience to catch up and not worry so much when he skips around. I felt like that was really insightful. Yeah, I, I do too. I think that it's... I think it's it's a function of our being sort of outside of the culture. It's sort of like if you see a movie that's loosely based on, I don't know, like the Bible. You know, you have you ever watched like the Ten Commandments or something? Yeah, and it's just sort of like the greatest hits of the Bible. Yeah, yeah. You're like, well, this doesn't make any sense as a story, but uh, everybody knows what's going on because it's part of our cultural lexicon. Yeah, and I right. think you see yeah. that sort of thing in basically any book adaptation. But um, mm -hmm. one of the things this made me think of was a conversation I saw on Twitter. I know Jeanette Ng was involved, but I can't remember who else was in it and if it was Jeanette's thread or if it was somebody else's and she was just participating. But regardless, it was talking about translating from Chinese into English and how especially translating poetry or really translating anything is very difficult because so much of the Chinese language and so much of Chinese uh, idiom and expression is heavily informed by a rich and well-known cultural history in terms of historical poetry and historical legendary and that sort of thing. Uh, the idea being that popular phrases that are used today have roots that are super deep and it's just sort of a cultural thing that through exposure you learn the nuances of that phrase or whatever mm -hmm. and in the same way it makes perfect sense to me that these movies might operate from the assumption that well you already know this story of course you've read it or you've heard somebody recount it to you or something like that what we're going to do is show you the highlight reel essentially uh, mm -hmm. here in the movie theater yeah it makes sense to me uh brendan yeah. continues uh, I can say that if you want a good book on understanding editing in Hong Kong movies in general, you should read David Bordwell's Planet Hong Kong. I don't know if he gets into editing for Western consumption, but he covers stuff like how fight scenes are edited, which is a super important part of Hong Kong action style, and one where they made several advances that Western critics completely overlooked. Uh, I wanted to mention that David Bordwell uh, is from the same city as me. He lives in Madison, and I often attend movies with him in the same movie theater. Uh, so yeah, small at some world. point it's a small world. Yeah. And, uh, so, so at some point maybe we'll, uh, see, see what he's up to and maybe pick his brain a little bit, but I, you know, the Hong Kong genre is adjacent to, right. And like connected to the Wuxia stuff that we look at, but it's we're not a film review podcast so right and anyway. yeah well and uh, hong kong cinema is not limited to wuxia of course there's a no. lot more to it than just that no i i yeah exactly brendan also says it might also be worth looking at ask for the moon 
by Meredith Lewis because she really dives deep into Chor Yuan. Don't think she gets into editing. You might even consider shooting her a PM on Twitter. Uh, so we will have to look into that. Yeah, uh, absolutely. I don't and know that one at all. Yeah. Yeah, I, I'm totally unfamiliar as well, but it sounds like that could be a real cool resource for us. So, Brendan, thanks so much for this information. It was really wonderful and way more comprehensive than I was expecting, and I, I, I really <laughs> appreciate it. <laughs> Oh, and then and then our Patreon, uh, Andreas Devour, sent us a link to a translated version of the Gulong novel that these two movies were based on. Yeah. So, proving again that our listeners and patrons are much smarter than we are. Oh, yes. Uh, but if you yeah. do want to tell us uh, some interesting facts, if you want to ask us a question, do any of that kind of stuff, feel free to hit us up either on Patreon, on Twitter, at Jung Hoo Hustle, uh, or at our email address, Jung Hoo Hustle at gmail.com. And, you know, with all of that, just feeling so smart and full of facts, I think it's time to say thanks for listening. And remember to make your Kung Fu stronger. John Who Hustle is being released on Misdirected Mark Productions, the media arm of Encoded Designs. If you're enjoying the show, please consider becoming a patron at patreon.com slash Hustle. You can reach Eli at ZapDynamic on Twitter or on his website, mythicgazetteer.com. You can reach me at Eric M. Farmer on Twitter or at my website, dogpoweredvehicle.com. You can reach both of us at Hustle on Twitter or Hustle at gmail.com, or on the Misdirected Mark website. Thanks for listening.